Hi students and welcome to another episode of Peace History Time and today we're going to be looking at the revolutions of the 1800s but before I do that I wanted to give a shout out to the students over at the Catholic High School of Baltimore periods D and F you guys are doing awesome studying for your AP exams uh, so where we're starting with this Congress of Vienna of 1815 uh, where we're really going with this is Prince Metternich right after Napoleon's reign. And what Metternich and Talleyrand and Alexander of Russia are trying to really do is stop this idea of liberalism from really forming. And uh, they saw what had happened with the French Revolution and they said, you know what? We got to get this strong conservative type of governments, these monarchs, the central authority power to come uh, all back into everything. Now, while a lot of these countries are going to be doing that, the one country that really has no revolution issues is going to be England throughout this whole entire time period. And really why not England is because a lot of the reforms that they do, they do through legislation and they're doing it through political processes rather than revolutions. Uh, you're going to see all those reform bills that were going on and everything to grant people some suffrage. Now... Um, and also England is going through this industrial revolution, so really the issues that they're kind of focusing on is going to be working rights and um, things of that nature. So the first country that we're really going to be focusing on uh, with all these revolutions is obviously going to be France. Because when I think revolutions, I'm always going to think France. Okay, so right after this, um, you know, Napoleon uh, comes back, these hundred days and everything like that, the monarch that's in power is King Louis the Eighteenth, and this is Louis the Sixteenth's younger brother. Uh, this King Louis the Eighteenth is known as the Desired. Um, he's also a very large fellow, and sometimes was kind of confined to a wheelchair. Now you're probably wondering, wait a second, what happened to Louis the Seventeenth? Well, when Louis XVI is executed, technically his son becomes Louis XVII even though he was never crowned. And when Louis XVII then dies, obviously then Louis' younger brother is going to become Louis XVIII. So it's just kind of showing you where at least this is going through. And in France with Louis XVIII, they establish a constitutional uh, monarchy. Okay, so there is going to be, um, you know, some give or take between, you know, legislative branches and the king. Specifically, though, what you're going to see, and he reigns from 1815 to 1824, uh, you're going to see that a lot of the bourgeois and the richer and the monarch, they're on the, um, you know, the monarch, as people that are supporting the monarch, are going to be the ones that are going to be granted the most power in this case. When Louis XVIII dies, um, their youngest brother, Charles X, and he's going to rule from 1824 to 1830, will take over. He is more of an absolutist. So now for these six years, this French, uh, the French people are saying, wow, what happened to the ideals of this French Revolution? What is going on? So there's going to be some riots, some protests um, in 1830 in which... Charles X is forced to abdicate the throne. And when he abdicates the throne, um, all of a sudden, France becomes more of a constitutional monarchy in, in regards to that they're trying to become a republic. This is where Louis Philippe then takes over, and he's known as the Citizen King. And he's going to rule from 1830 to 1848. And the reason why he's known as the Citizen King is because he was known to try to grant more rights uh, to more people. However, though, there are going to be other revolutions that are going to be going on. Uh, specifically, uh, there's one that we all know from, if you ever saw Les Mis, uh, where these students were protesting and then they're completely all slaughtered. Uh, that was known as the uh, July Revolution. Okay, so where we're going, at least with France, you're seeing that they're still kind of going all over the place. Um, until 1848, in which then... They, they attempt to establish another republic, and um, 1848 is a very, very big year in Europe with regards to revolutions. Uh, there's just going to be this revolutionary movement that is going to sweep through all of Europe. And what happens is that in 1848, Louis Philippe is forced to 
um, abdicate the throne himself. There's a lot of social issues that are going on in which then there's going to be an election where Louis Napoleon, and yes, you heard that correctly, Napoleon, he is going to be elected president of this new republic. And by 1852, he gets reelected in a landslide, and Louis decides to declare himself emperor of the Second Empire of France, in which then he will rule until 1870 as an absolutist. So all of a sudden, you can see that, at least in France, they try to start off with this constitutional monarchy from you know the French Revolution days to a full out you know republic and then napoleon and then a constitutional monarch again to an emperor again france is all over the place when it comes to these revolutions so just keep in mind that um and then he will declare himself napoleon the third and you're probably once again wondering well what happened to napoleon the second that's napoleon's son in which then he just kind of bypasses all of this okay so once again france a lot of revolutions, a lot of abdications, and in the end of all of this, in 1870, this is where uh, they're going to be ruled then by Napoleon until we get to the Franco-Prussian War, but that will be a little bit later in this video. So for right now, that is where we're going to stop France. I had told you that 1848 is just going to be this crazy year. Um, if you're looking into Austria, Metternich is, flees Austria in 1848 as different um, revolutionary, revolutions are kind of popping up from this nationalism uh, that is forming uh, but we're going to focus on Germany next and the reason why we're focusing on Germany next because Germany does influence and um, really create a lot of rifts at least towards the later half of the 1800s um, in 1848 there's going to be you know some squabbling and some you know revolution there's going to be this Frankfurt assembly and it's going to kind of establish the route that Germany is going to take and there's two different sides one is going to be greater Germany, the other is going to be lesser Germany. And it's these German words that there's no way that I can even, um, you know, pronounce or whatnot. So just know that one is going to be more greater Germany and greater Germany is including Austria into this whole entire German, you know, uh, country. And then there's lesser Germany, which is just no, we don't even want Austria, you know, involved with all this. And... Austria, by the very end of this, they're actually going to remain outside of this greater Germany. So really, um, when we get to Otto van Bismarck, it's kind of more of a lesser Germany rather than a greater Germany. Now, this is going to lead to Otto van Bismarck, who's going to be the prime minister um, underneath Kaiser Wilhelm I and you know, of Prussia and one of these revolutionary type of individuals because he says that the way that the German... Uh, people can unite is through blood and iron and when we're talking about blood and iron we're talking about really wars this idea of you know taking things over industry uh, to make sure that you know we are conquering you know the people and he starts bringing about nationalism this german pride that had not been around in you know centuries because if you think about the holy roman empire it was just a bunch of german confederation you know states this loose group of uh, individuals so he goes to war with denmark in 1864 and he wins he goes to war with austria in 1866 and he wins there as well and this is going to lead into a showdown with france so in 1870 the prussians are going to have this war with France. And it's this Franco-Prussian war in which out of Bismarck and the Prussians win. And when they win this war, they kind of declare this new German state. Um, Napoleon III is forced to abdicate the throne. Um, so he's now gone, and this is going to lead into another republic and a lot more French problems, which we'll kind of discuss in a little bit. Uh, the Germans are going to take Alsace-Lorraine, this region of France. And these French people are going to remember this. They're going to remember how France had taken over these lands. And they're going to punish the Germans when you know, it comes back into uh, you know, the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. So um, Otto van Bismarck you know, declares... You know, German independence inside of France at Versailles, 
uh, this new German country. And then even though he's more of a conservative figure, he starts ruling in a way of real politique in which he is putting um, policies that are good for the German people in front of his own personal you know, public opinions on things. Um, and one of the things that he's really afraid of is socialism rising up in, you know, these new German states. So what he does in order to get rid of socialism is to enact socialist policies himself. And when he establishes these socialist policies, there's nothing that the Socialism Party can really add to anything, so they just kind of disappear. And he becomes, you know, the prime minister, you know, and ruling for Kaiser Wilhelm, you know, until uh, Kaiser Wilhelm will eventually die in 18, or, you know, eventually he's going to die. And then by 1888, you're going to see Kaiser Wilhelm II will dismiss Otto van Bismarck, and then that's kind of it. And we bring up Kaiser Wilhelm II a lot during World War II, but at least you're kind of getting the idea that he is the man um, that really does dismiss Bismarck and tries to rule everything on his own. Now, getting back into Austria, we said that in 1848, there's going to be nationalistic movements. There's a lot of different ethnicities within Austria, and this is going to force Metternich to kind of leave town and skip out, even though he's going to come back, but then he's going to be removed anyway. You have the Slavs, the Czechs, uh, you have some northern Italian states, Serbs, um, you know, your Croats, your Hungarians. All these different groups want independence from this Austrian Empire. Um, now, the th thing is that none of them are going to get anything because they all squabble with each other and they can't get anything done, all these different minority groups. So what happens is that Franz Joseph he's going to assume the throne of Austria and he's going to rule from 1848 to 1916. So right in the middle of world war one. So it's a very long period of time and he centralizes power and he pretty much kind of crushes all of these nationalistic movements. But what he's really known for is having a dual monarchy in which then he was going to be the ruler of Hungary and the ruler of Austria, um, he's going to be the same ruler, very similar to what we had James uh, the first of um, England, but he was James the sixth of Scotland, kind of this dual monarch type of thing. And then he will keep this Austria-Hungarian empire very strong for the next 60 or so years. So Austria has, you know, a little bit different um, approach with their authoritative, you know, putting down revolutions. Um, even in Russia, you start to see these revolutions happen. When Alexander the First, and if you remember, Alexander the First was Napoleon's um, bromancing guy, I guess you could say. When he dies in 1825, he has two um, two brothers, Constantine. Or not two brothers, but you know these two brothers are squabbling over power, and it's Constantine and Nicholas. And everyone kind of wants Constantine. Um, Constantine, they think, is going to be more progressive in a change of reforms. Um, and the army is even supporting Constantine. But Nicholas was able to crush this Decemberist revolt um, in which he kind of like shoots people, kills people, massacres people. And then he becomes an authoritative figure. Um, so and that all happens in 1825. So Nicholas then, you know, is going to rule as a authoritative, absolutist, centrist type of individual. Then Alexander II will rule, and he's different, okay? Alexander II ends serfdom. He's more of a progressive in Russia granting these reforms. Um, however, though, the negative is that he's assassinated. And when he's assassinated, it goes to his son, Nicholas II. And Nicholas II is really the one that we know a lot about this Romanov family because he's the one during the Russian Revolution. Um, he's the one that they start taking away, um, you know, uh, they start removing him from power during World War I. Now, while all this is happening, you know, Russia starts to try to modernize. They build the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Um, they're starting to industrialize by the 1890s. They're starting to get some uh, technological advancements. But one of their biggest blunders is going to be in 1905. And I'll talk about that when we do the causes of World War I. But it's this loss during the Russo-Japanese War. So that's going to be one of the downfalls of Russia. 
Getting back into France, after France loses in the Franco-Prussian War, they start up a brand new republic. This is now going to be the Third Republic um, of, you know, of France. So already we had, you know, the First Republic was during, you know, the time of, you know, the French Revolution. The Second Republic was going to be, you know, after then to the 1800s, after Napoleon. Uh, so they lost Alsace-Lorraine. It ends the Second uh, Empire, this Third Republic. Um, and the thing about this Third Republic is that right away it's an unstable government. Uh, they are having a, you know, an uprising with this socialist group called the Paris Commune in which they do put down, but it's very unstable. There's anti-Semitism uh, going on a lot in this uh, in France. There's something called the Dreyfus Affair in which um, a military officer was accused of being a traitor and they knew he was innocent the, uh, the entire time, but because he was Jewish, they put all the blame on him. It's going to take years. Um, I believe 1906 is when this Dreyfus Affair from 1894, it's about 12 years, in which then Dreyfus finally gets his, you know, name cleared and Dreyfus then goes on to fight even throughout World War One for the side of France but France does have some uh, democracy improvements compared to some of these other places like they will have universal male um, suffrage they will have a social welfare system so that is just some of the things that at least um, separates France from some of these other uh, Central European countries during this 1800s of this revolutionary period. And the last country that we're going to be focusing on is going to be this Italian unification process. And where this really starts is from the Kingdom of Sardinia. They're the ones that are going to be leading the movement because they're really the only independent um, Italian state that's left. You have King Victor Emmanuel II and his Prime Minister Count Cavour. Um, and Cavour is one of the more political um, aspects of it. Um, one of the more nationalistic, this romantic, romantic uh, writer Mazzini kind of gets the people passionate about it, but Cavour is the one that's really putting everything into place. And he, really what he wants is that he wants to attack Austria. He wants to get the parts of northern Italy back away from Austrian, Austrian control. And he knows that the only way that he can do this is if he partners up with Napoleon III at this time uh, to try to go into this war with France, or uh, war with Austria, with France's help. Um, in return, the Italians would give them French-speaking uh, Nice and part of, you know, southern France, down right by the French, uh, French Riviera. So in 1859, they go to war with Austria, and very, very shortly after this, Napoleon pulls out all of his troops because he's fearing Prussia. Remember, Prussia still kind of has this idea, is it going to be greater Germany, is it going to be lesser Germany? So they're afraid that Prussia is going to attack them. Shocker, they're going to anyway, but still, he's afraid of this. So where Cavour does, he sends in Goberaldi, um, who's going to invade Sicily in 1860 with his red shirts, and they're able then to get Sicily to join in with the Kingdom of Italy. And by 1861, you're going to see that there is definitely a unification uh, with everyone, with all these uh, different Italian states. But the thing is, the Italians, uh, Northern Italy, is still going to be held by parts of Austria. Um, Austria is going to be holding Venice and places like that. Um, so the whole entire country of Italy really isn't going to be fully kind of unified the way that we know it until the 1870s. And even when we do have Italy being unified, there's going to be an issue. And where the issue is coming in is that you're going to see um, classes and you're going to see regionalism where northern Italy is going to be more industrialized and southern Italy is going to be more agricultural. And the thing is, a lot of Italian politics is being dominated by southern landowners and these powerful landowners that are kind of controlling, um, you know, day to day, uh, you know, politics when it comes to uh, the Italian government. So all of this is going to lead into the next video, which is going to be imperialism and getting into some of these causes of why World War I is going to begin in 1914. You are seeing a common theme with these revolutions is nationalism and, and uh, liberalism. So these are kind of the building blocks into what's going to be a very chaotic 
um, group of years, especially the early part of the 1900s. In fact, all the 20th century is kind of chaotic if you look at even with the Cold War. So I wanted to thank you again for um, watching this uh, you know, brief overview of all these revolutions uh, that were going on at this time. Please uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I also have different playlists going up here for you know European history and U.S. history. Other than that, thank you again for watching. Uh, keep on studying, and let's go get a five on that test.